All righty. Good afternoon, y'all. I hope uh, everyone is having a wonderful Friday. I'm, uh, I'm hoping we can get this in because I'm in store for some very, very bad weather. Uh, it's up in North Alabama at the moment, uh, but it's moving quick. So fingers crossed we can get this, uh, get this going and, and get it in because this will be a great show today. Today, we are joined by none other than Mr. <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Douglas Godshaw, Doug Godshaw. Um, he was a CCN vet. Uh, he operated out of Mylock, uh, Kason, I believe, as well. And if I'm not mistaken, he had uh, a TDY stint down at CCS, if I'm not mistaken, or at least uh, ran it running Cambodia targets. So um, I'm going to hand it off to him, let him give a little brief bio on himself, and uh, we'll get the ball rolling with questions and whatever comes up. The floor is yours, Mr. Doug. Thank you, bud. Uh, my name is Doug. Um, uh, I am the son, grandson, and great-great-grandchildren of many citizen soldiers in the United States. Uh, our history goes back to the Revolutionary War, where one of our cousins and my aunt has discovered 44 members who served in the Revolutionary War. We lived in eastern Pennsylvania, where the British armies and the American armies marched up and down, so there are lots of us who have ancestors who work for three months at a time in the militia. Uh, I have an ancestor uh, in the Civil War, a gentleman in the 1st Pennsylvania Infantry who was captured in the Battle of the Wilderness and, and was unfortunately sent to the, the world's worst Confederate prison in Andersonville and, and perished there. I have a grandfather who served in World War One, and World War II. My father served at the Navy and came back with a a lung full of uh, shrapnel from a Japanese kamikaze attack. His best friend, his brother, uh, limped for the rest of his life as a result of a German bullet in Anzio. And uh, we have just been citizen soldiers. When the wars came, we served. Uh, my history in the Special Forces began when my mother gave me a book at my senior year in high school. It's called The Green Braves by Robin Moore, a wonderful book. Robin Moore, uh, was the, the first great chronicler of special forces. Special forces were the first great unit that arrived out of the, the Vietnam War, which was a terrible debacle for several reasons. But Robin Moore's book got me. I wanted to be a Green Beret. I started college. It didn't work for me. And uh, I must say there was a lot of other special forces soldiers who were the same way. They started college. It didn't work for them. They enlisted in the Army and wound up in the Special Forces. I can give you five or six names of guys who started like that. So I enlisted in the Army in 1967, enlisted for Airborne Infantry, went to infantry school, and uh, took the Special Forces test and, and wound up in Fort Bragg, actually, where I'd been in basic training. And uh, much to my surprise, after a month or so of being in training group, I was called to the dispensary from a medic. We said, uh, sir, well, he didn't call me sir. I was a private. He said, yeah, you have bad eyes. And I said, yeah, I do. I've got glasses here. I've had glasses since the third grade. Well, you can't possibly serve in special forces. You're going to be serving behind enemy lines. Uh, we're, we're going to throw you out of special forces training group. Well, I was crushed. I was absolutely crushed. I mean, I want to be a Green Beret more than anything. And... Uh, as a consequence, I was sent to Vietnam with two other guys who were thrown out of a great uh, training group who had bad eyes, a guy named Bill Brick and a guy named Michael Morehouse. And we traveled to Vietnam together, wound up at uh, uh, the replacement barracks at Benoit. And a uh, first lieutenant in Green Berets came up to us, a Green Beret with a, you know, yellow, with a silver uh, bar, first lieutenant, said, you guys still want to be in special forces? We said, hell yes. We didn't say yes. We said, hell yes. We wanted to be Green Berets. So we were in, in, took taken back into Special Forces, but we were sent to MACV SOG, which all of the you folks who are watching this know about MACV SOG. It was a super secret unit composed of Special Forces, Green Berets, running recon missions up and down what were, what is now called the Ho Chi Minh Trail in North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, we traveled in, in, in recon teams with two or three Americans and the rest in Dij being either Hmong uh, uh, or other uh, tribes of the uh, <clears throat> Montagnards, Brew in my case. And uh, 
uh, traveled across the enemy lines without identification. We didn't have name tags that identified us as Americans. They didn't. We didn't have dog tags. We had no insignia. But of course, uh, I was then a 20-year-old blonde, uh, probably 160 pounds, uh, soaking wet. I didn't look anything like a Vietnamese, so I don't know how we we're going to pass as something other than American soldiers. At any rate, uh, we went from uh, Benoit to Nha Trang. We got three weeks of combat orientation training, and I was sent to Fubai to join a team. I wasn't assigned to a team. I was assigned to the the uh, uh, company size unit, and and the uh, and and uh, for for a very brief period of time, and then I was assigned to Mylock. Mylock was the successor to the Kason Forward Operating Operating Base. Um, I was never actually at uh, Kason, uh, but I was with the Kason successors. Major Sincere, Major Clyde Sincere, took the the Kason FOB and planted it in Mylock, which was a town just south of, uh, of Route 9, which was uh, adjacent to east, east west to the uh, DMZ and just east of Quezon. And I started with RT Georgia, Recon Team Georgia. Tom Kiel Cofield was my 1-0. Uh, Stan Seating was the 1-1, one, one, and I was the junior boy, the 1-2, carrying the radio. After a couple of weeks, um, I was uh, asked to go, and this would be at the end of August 68, I Went to Vietnam in July 68, did the training in the train, and was sent to Phu Bai to serve with a company size unit, the Hatchet Force, then to Mylock to serve with a recon unit. So we're now in the end of August uh, 68, and I was told to go to Saigon, excuse me, to um, uh, Da Nang for a promotion board. I'm a PFC at the time. And, and I went there on the 22nd of August uh, 1968. Early in the morning of uh, August 23rd, 1968, we were attacked from within and without, from the beaches and from in, in the interior, by an NVA force that knew we were in the we were we were attacking the, their supply chain and the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I had stayed that night uh, with a uh, Bill Brick who had a hooch there. Bill and I, as I told you before, came to Vietnam. He was together. We were assigned to. He was assigned to. Uh, da Nang, and when the uh, at about 1 30 in the morning, when all of a sudden there were explosions in the air with satchel shells being uh, thrown inside our hooches and gunfire, he took off for his position on the perimeter. I was stay I was staying with John Peters. He was another gentleman from up north who was staying staying for the promotion boards. John is a very smart guy. He was a very literate guy. He helped uh, John. He helped uh, John Tiltmeyer write uh, the, the the books. At any rate, the, the, that was the first time I came under fire. I opened up the door after Bill Brick took off with his weapon to his assigned space and saw uh, an NBA guy uh, walking, th throwing hatchels, uh, satchels of, of explosives my way. I left my hooch that night. I hooked up with a young blonde lieutenant whose name I can never remember. I don't know who it was. And later hooked up with a guy named Spider Parks, who was a reservist from Dallas, Texas at that time. And we fought back against the, the invaders all night. And eventually, at, during the dawn, um, the last of the uh, invaders were, were caught near what can only be called the, uh, uh, the bathroom. And uh, they, they uh, were, were, were uh, subdued. Uh, that day, I uh, uh, I was very lucky not to have been wounded. As you know, there were 16 Green Berets killed that day. There were 50 more that received Purple Hearts. And there were maybe maybe 120 to 140 Green Berets in, in the camp at that time. It was a tremendous, tremendous slaughter. And, of course, because back then we operated under top secret laws, uh, it never hit the newspaper. But it was the worst day of special forces of Green Beret losses in our history, even up until today. I helicoptered back to my lock, reported to, to Colonel Sincere, excuse me, Major Sincere, and uh, he debriefed me on the damage. The next day, I went out on my first mission with Recon Georgia with Tom Cofield as my leader and, and Stan Seating uh, being my 1-1, one, one, and I was the 1-2 carrying the Prick 25. So I probably carried another 50 pounds on, on my uh, body. Uh, Stan and Tom were wonderful people. They had treated me like a human being. 
We'd gone out on training me, me, missions together. And I was always very scared that people were going to find out I had not gone through Special Forces Training Group and received my SMOS. Uh, but they were they were great. On the uh, fifth day of our mission in Laos, and I learned later, was an, later that it was an AO that no team had survived more than a week. On the fifth day, we'd heard no more than a war, warning shot, and we were waiting to be extracted. And um, But the weather was bad. Tom Cofield made the commo check for me at 6 a.m., and we uh, uh, waited for the weather to clear for the helicopters to come. Right after the commo check, I was standing in the middle of the perimeter and we were attacked by what's estimated to be a reinforced platoon. The estimate was made by the helicopters who finally came to rescue us. The helicopters were warming up and waiting to come to get us. When they were found out that it was, it was uh, IFR weather, that, that we were completely fogged in, they took, they took off anyway. The helicopter pilots steered by he, hitting their slicks on the top of the trees. There was no visibility. Absent the, the, the bravery of those helicopter pilots, I'm a dead man. They came to us. As I said, they estimated they saw some soldiers, more soldiers coming up the hill. We had already been badly wounded. We lost one of our indig. We lost our Arvin sergeant. We lost several. We had many, many other wounded. And the uh, uh, helicopters with uh, Chase, uh, a medic from, uh, from Mylock Thompson, came and I was able to help extricate the team. As a consequence of the wounds that we had to our indige, our indige uh, was a really nice gentleman, and he had a hole through his shoulder that you could see through. And we went to the medevac hospital at Quang Tree. When we landed at Quang Tree, we asked for assistance for our brew indige for his wound, and they refused because they was they weren't uh, he was an American gentleman. We convinced the medical staff by locking and loading on them that they really needed to attend to him, take him to surgery, and get him fixed up. After we convinced them, they did. We then flew back to Mylock. When I got to Mylock, I'd had this pain in my left shoulder. I didn't know what it was, and I realized that I'd had shrapnel on my shoulder, and it was coming out of two spots of my shoulder. I was talking to the helicopter pilot. I said, sir, but for you, I'm not alive. And he said, how did you know that you won't, weren't wounded? Well, they were throwing grenades inside our permit perimeter and I threw them back and they threw them in and I threw them back. I was able to get outside the perimeter, put some fire on the, on the bad guys, able to talk to the, uh, helicopter crews, able to talk to, 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 uh, uh, some A1Es who came in. And, uh, but we, I, I found out that I was wounded. Uh, we had the Colonel from Fubai come up, uh, Colonel Barr, Roy Barr, what a great man he was. And I uh, had been bandaged up by then. I looked like I had a bad wound. It wasn't a bad wound. It was just grenade shrapnel. And he was a very nice gentleman to me. Uh, Stan Seating was killed. Uh, the first guy I knew who was killed in combat when I was on a team, when I was on at, at uh, Da Nang the week before, of course, Bill Brick was killed, 15 others. And I knew many, many of those gentlemen. But it was a real change to find out to be on a team in combat inside Laos behind enemy lines and have Stan CD be killed. Afterwards, we found out later, I found out later that where there were some people that put us in for medals. There was a, a, a sergeant who wrote up a medal for me for a silver star. It was submitted and they gave it to Stan Seeding's family, which was the right thing to do. Stan passed away. He got a silver star. I received a bronze star and later received another bronze star later on. I ran a couple of missions more out of my lock and then went to uh, CCS, as you mentioned, Bud, uh, TDY in, in October of uh, 1968, which turned out to be lucky because, you know, in November of 30th, 1968, on the Elder Sun mission, we had a bunch of guys from my lock who climbed aboard a, a slick, which was transporti transporting bad ammunition to be deposited in NBA territory, which was loaded with, with, with uh, trick wires, so that when we deposited the the load of ammunition, when they went to get it, they would be blown up. Unfortunately, uh, that mission ended in the air when uh, AAA anti aircraft air, air fire from Laos uh, shot down the helicopter, and we lost a bunch of uh, guys that day. Uh, I was uh, then serving in uh, uh, CCS. 
doing TDY on RT Elmira. I ran two missions with RT Elmira. One was with our one zero, who was a very fine uh, lieutenant, uh, another blonde haired lieutenant. His name was Gregory Grandison, a really fine guy. He got sick and went in the hospital. And we ran a second mission with RT Elmira, but this time it was an E5, whose name I will not disclose, who led the mission. He was the one one or second in charge. And we ran a, a mission together. And we were deposited on a, uh, after the first mission with, Lieutenant Grandison, which was uneventful. It's the only time I was out on a mission I didn't get shot at. Then we went to, uh, with with this uh, a gentleman uh, substituting as the one zero. We were deposited on the side of a large river, which was, of course, the Mekong River. And we were assigned to look at the river traffic and also see if we could find a prisoner. After we landed, uh, we saw, I, I saw a large boat in the river with a with a large cannon on it. It looked like a 50 caliber uh, gun cruising up and down. And I told my leader, I said, if the guy turns back towards the island where we are, then uh, he's found us and we're going to have to defend ourselves. Well, sure enough, the boat turned around and found us and headed towards our island. I turned to toward my substitute leader who was sitting next to a tree chattering. He was completely out of his mind. He couldn't act. He was scared to death. And I took over the team. I put my most experienced brew on the tip of the island with claymores. I took the waist of the island, but there was a small path onto the island and defended the waist. Sure enough, unfortunately, I was correct. The boat came to us from the north and attacked us. They also put a small detachment on the shore and attacked us from the shore, and we were ready for both of them. I'm, I'm very pleased to say, as a consequence of that day, we were extracted without any casualties to our team. The colonel was on the uh, uh, was was on the the commo stream when I called a prairie fire emergency, and after we uh, survived, he asked us to be reinserted. I told him, "Sir, we could not be reinserted." He was not happy with me. I said, "Sir, we cannot be reinserted. We made too much noise." We went back to uh, Bammy to it, and I reported and I turned in my report, but I did not mention that our temporary team leader had been not only in inconsequential but harmful but i told the sergeant major never send this guy out on a mission again i returned uh, after uh, my lack was closed in 68 and i did my tdy at ccs i returned to denang i ran a number of missions as a strap hanger i volunteered as a strap hanger georgia had been uh, destroyed because stamp seating was killed um, and I, I volunteered for as many missions as i could I was always conscious of the fact that I'd never received my de S designation, and there were always some people in the camp who were critical of me for that. And then a couple of months after uh, the last mission I ran as a recon team leader, uh, we were on a, 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 an infamous mission called Dewey Canyon in Laos. And this was a battalion-sized operation where three companies of uh, uh, SOG troops and uh, led by a colonel, uh, excuse me, a major named Moore. I was still on a recon team. I, I know uh, a couple of, uh, of the commanders of the company, uh, the companies that learned about them later. Uh, but it, we were walking on a uh, on the west side of the Ashell Valley on the top of a ridge looking for bad guys. And the, there were Marines on the Vietnam side. It was sort of a pincer motion to see if we could force these guys out. Uh, Kenny Boyd had a company. Mike Armstrong had a company. And I knew them both later and before. They're both really quality commanders. But I was running point, and I made, we, we came up to a point on the top of the of a ridge, and we found a little cache of enemy supplies. It was a small cache, some rice, there was some uniforms, there were some combs. And we stopped there. As I said, I was running point. And uh, Major Moore came up, and he said, uh, Sergeant, and I was a sergeant by then, I want you to destroy this cache. And I said, sir, with all due respect, We've made too much noise as it is with three companies, battalion size in operation. When we destroy this cache, we're going to make more noise. More noise. I was used to being a recon man. We didn't want to make any noise for a week. We didn't talk. We used hand signals. We didn't do anything to make any noise. And here's this major telling me to destroy this cache. Well, we did. I followed orders. It was my turn to be replaced on the point. I was replaced by another team. That team walked about 150 yards into a perfect L-shaped ambush, and they got wiped out.
by the NBA. The team commander at that time was a was an acquaintance of mine, and he was from Pennsylvania, sort of from the same uh, part of Pennsylvania I was. It was a great tragedy. The commander, Major Moore, panicked. We stayed in place for three days. We dug in. We dug uh, foxholes every day. We got mortared at 7 o'clock in the morning. And after a couple of days, the engineers in our group took some C4, blew some trees down, and were able to uh, uh, take out uh, uh, some trees so it could create an LZ. We had some marine helicopters come in and start to pick us up one late afternoon. I managed to get uh, uh, my team onto one of those helicopters. But when we got to, to a, a temporary LZ in Vietnam, one of our colonels, one of our full colonels was there. And we found out that Major Moore, who was the commander of this battalion-sized unit, had come out on the first helicopter, the commander. He had left his troops on the ground. We later learned that one of the Nung companies started to, to desert that night. It was a disaster. Um, we got most of the, the, the troops out, went back to Da Nang. I saw Major Moore walking around the camp a couple days later, saluting and saying goodbye. I'm going back to home. I don't want, want to tell you where his home was. I don't want people trying to find him. But he was relieved of duty. I then joined Mike Armstrong with a hatchet force in Da Nang. Mike, Mike Armstrong is a wonderful guy. Um, he helped the brew uh, learn English. He helped us learn the brew language. He was a wonderful guy. He's been sending money back to the group ever since the late 60s. And I ran a couple of missions with him as first sergeant, which sounds like a big title, but I was the only other American. Mike was an officer and the commander. I was a sergeant, so they, they called me a first sergeant, but I was still only an E5. So I ran a couple of missions with him. We had a couple of missions where uh, uh, we, we were trying to snatch a prisoner. We were unsuccessful. And the last mission I was on with Mike, we had, unfortunately, we had a helicopter crash come in to extract us, but uh, we all survived. I was treated very well in, in Da Nang. When I left, the sergeant major and, and, the, and the colonel offered me uh, my S designation on my MOS, which I turned down. They offered me an opportunity to go to OCS, which I turned down. I was very concerned with just going back to civilian life and getting my college degree, which I had screwed them up. Uh, so I was very, very, that was treated extremely well. Um, years later, um, I became a, I, I finished college, became a lawyer, became a, married to a wonderful woman, had two great children. Um, I got a call late in the afternoon on an August, uh, August day. And this fellow said, uh, is this Doug Godshell? And I said, uh, yes, who is this? I thought it was some salesman. Well, this is Eldon. This is Eldon Bargewell. Eldon was a mate of mine in, in Da Nang. I ran two missions with him as he was a 1-0 in RT Michigan. He was a wonderful person. Never had any disagreement with Eldon in my entire life. He was a great leader. He's a wonderful athlete. He could run like a deer, which was a great asset for a recon guy. Running was very important because we were always being chased by bad guys that had more numbers than us. But he's a wonderful guy. And as you all know, he went to OCS, became an officer. He became in charge of um, Delta, and, and and one of his later jobs as a major general was running um, uh, the operations in Iraq during the very bad days in 05, 06, 07. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. But he, to, to me, he was just Eldon. So he said, oh, Doug, you got to get involved with Special Operations Association. I said, what's that? I have I, I, any idea of that. I tried to join the Special Forces Operations but the Association, but because I didn't have an S, a designation my MOS, they wouldn't take it. Well, there's lots of guys back then who didn't have an S designation. And and uh, I, I was later admitted as a life member of the Special Forces Association. But I went out to Las Vegas to join Eldon. I was nominated by Eldon to be the Special Operations Association. There's no better nomination that anyone could have. And I was fully accepted. After a few years, uh, uh, Tilt Meyer, uh, my good friend from uh, Fubai and Da Nang, uh, was president. He asked me to be on the board, and I so served on the board. And a few years after that, Larry Trimble, uh, one of the heroes of 23 August, October 68 at uh, Da Nang, approached me. He said, Doug, you're, you're a veteran of 23 August uh, 68. You've got to help us put on a program. 
So uh, 50 years later, 2018, we put on a program to honor the families of those who were slain on 23 August 68. Dan Thompson helped me greatly on that. Dan Thompson was the first lieutenant uh, at Da Nang. And we did a program on the, exactly the 50th anniversary at the wall in, in Washington with our wives and many of the families. It was a very sad and very wonderful event at the same time. And then at SOAR, at our convention, we put on the same uh, presentation for the family. We brought the families out to SOAR. Major General Eldon Bargewell and Sergeant Major uh, Spider Park served as the honorary co-chair, and we honored the families. We had over 300 people at the breakfast, including six Medal of Honor winners. Uh, sorry, I uh, I spoke at uh, Mike uh, Taylor's uh, funeral in Hawaii last year, and I started to tear up. Uh, I told my wife, I'm sorry, I always do this. And uh, Kimo, <coughs> excuse me, Kimo That's Will was there. Sergeant Major and CIA operative, and he said, Doug, that means you have a heart. So I apologize. It's fine. No, no, no apologies I needed, sir. I cheer up. So that's a short, short, short version. Uh, happy Friday. Great to talk with you, bud. Thank you, sir. I greatly, uh, greatly appreciate that, uh, that, that, uh, that bio and, and outlay and, uh, while uh I, while while you ended with sore i uh I, I while we're talking about it i just want to say thank you for uh accepting me and uh treating me so well the week i was uh able and honored enough to be invited and able to attend with john mcgovern's widow um i i uh really got to see how uh, y'all honor, uh, and sadly, that was the first year that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Taylor wasn't there, and I got to see Mr. Kimo and uh, I think uh, Mr. Wade Ishimura uh, give his speech, and it, it was uh, very moving. I, I felt uh, completely out of place being amongst y'all, uh, but I, I just want to thank you for, for showing me such a good time and, and letting me be a part of that. You're very welcome. And Ishii, Wade, we call him Ishii. He knows more generals than all of us combined. He's a wonderful sergeant major, and he keeps in charge with a lot of the high-end people in SF and uh, special ops. Ishii's a great guy. That he is. He's got a lot of experiences. And, folks, if y'all read <laughs> any, uh, any book written on SF from – gosh, maybe the 70s, 80s on, uh, his name is going to be – more than likely in it um but uh yeah I, I, that that's sore will always uh be that that experience that that week will always hold a special place in my heart i uh i i, I there's no word to describe it uh, just uh, amazing um do you uh do you mind if uh we ask a few questions and and go uh, ahead I don't, okay excellent excellent um We've had some guys, uh, you know, have experience. Well, before this, I wanted to clear something up because I've, I've not cleared this up because uh, I was under the impression you had it. Um, I thought you and Mr. Cliff Newman both ended up getting your S qualifications at some point in time. That's true. There were a lot of people, Cliff, probably Clyde Sincere. We all got mm -hmm. our S qualifications, but um, – uh, I was embarrassed. I, I was embarrassed the entire year because a couple of guys kept working me over. But I will tell you, when I talked to David Maurer, and uh, who wrote, uh, I think, the best novel about us, um, he asked me how many missions did you run, and I said I didn't run that many, maybe to ten to twelve. And he started laughing. He said the average guy ran two to three. I said you're kidding. Uh, so I, I I wasn't really that perceptive on the ground for the year of what was going on around me. And uh, that that's quite a quite a lot of activity. As I mean, as you guys heard when when he was given a, a a rundown on that, and I actually recently spoke to Mr. Clyde, and he told me to tell all of y'all hello. Uh, I, I meant to share that on the Facebook group page, but but I had forgotten. That's good. Um, uh, we we recently spoke to Mr. Rick Estes as well, and you know, well, I didn't know uh, that he was colorblind as well. Um, 
in your time, were there a lot of guys colorblind that wore glasses? Um, again, you mentioned Ken, Kenny Boyd, uh, Mr. Ken Boyd. He had glasses. Uh, yep, he did. Was, was that an issue? Uh, I'm not sure how that worked. I mean, I, I uh, recently, I'm an old man now, had cataract surgery. I see better now than I have since the third grade, and I could qualify. And I, I told uh, Ray Frobarp, I'm going to I'm gonna low crawl back to the dispensary in Fort Bragg and nail that son of a bitch who threw me out of special forces. But I, I in later years, they would, if you were SF qualified, they would send you and get the operation to get your eyes fixed. And, and Rick Estes was a commo guy, uh, and I, as you know, very, uh, very well-known SOA guy, former president. Um, I didn't know he was colorblind, um, but it, it, the, the, one of the things about Robin Moore's book was that we were all different, and he talked about guys that like me that had glasses. They talked about kind of weirdos being in special forces. We weren't Marines. We weren't straight lake infantrymen. We were different. We had a different way of looking at the world. We were willing to take risks. We were willing to learn, to, uh, to, to learn different things. So that's one of the reasons the special forces uh, uh, attracted me. There's uh, me with glasses on the right-hand side, and there's uh, Mike Morehouse. He had glasses. He, he, both of us were really ugly. None of us would, could get a date back then. And then in that picture, there's also uh, Eldon uh, Bargewell uh, with his team someplace. But yeah, Mike and I were both ugly with glasses. He, he, Mike got blown up uh, uh, on the helicopter pad in Da Nang. I was out on a mission. It might have been with Eldon. And uh, yeah, there's two skinny guys. And uh, he got blown up very badly. He was medevac to uh, Japan. And um, I tried to chase him down later after I got involved with the SOA. He passed away, and Eldon was looking for him also. Eldon had about a thousand little Manila folders with with some documentation about different guys who trying to find us all. And uh, actually, uh, Bonnie Cooper found out where Mike Morehouse was buried. He passed away in the '90s. I talked to his widow, and and uh, he had become a contractor. But the army declared that he died of his wounds because of Vietnam. And so his name is on the wall now. His name was put on the wall later. And you will find Michael Morehouse there. And I've been to the wall many times. And I look for his name and, and stand seating uh, among others. But uh, Mike died as a consequence of his actions in uh, Vietnam. Yeah, there's another picture of a bunch of ugly guys. Yeah, that's Mike <laughs> on the rest. Mike and I were the two ugliest guys in Da Nang. You, you, uh, you're too hard on yourself. I, I, I doubt that. I'm, I'm sure you had <laughs> no problems whatsoever. Um, uh, we, we, as, when I was talk, uh, about to lead in earlier, uh, we, we hear sure. guys uh, later on talking about uh, coming in country, and they're immediately whisked off to one zero school or, or, or something like right. that. Uh, right. You, you had mentioned the combat orientation course. Uh, right. What was that like? What, 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 what... That was in the Trang. And, uh, you know, for you brought up Rick Estes' name. He came in the country after me. He was a commo guy. I spent most of the time at Commo Shack, but he ran some missions. He didn't go through that. I'm not, you know, the Army was changing a lot quickly. That was a three-week school. It was called Combat Orientation Course or the Cock Course. Um I thought it was all guys coming into SF because uh, the Trang was the headquarters for Fifth Group. I don't know, but I know that myself and Mike and 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 uh, Bill Brick all went through it. There was a couple other people, the names I don't want to mention because it didn't turn out so well for them. But we wound up uh, going to uh, up north to uh, Fubai or Da Nang. Uh, later on, I mean, there was a lieutenant uh, who took an interest in me and got me into Rakondo School. I turned that down. I turned down OCS, um, uh, and it wasn't because I thought I was uh, deficient. I just wanted to prove to all of these guys that I got thrown out of group that I could, you know, run some recon missions and so forth. But uh, there was a lot of different opportunities. A lot of guys in in, in uh, SF were offered OCS. I mean, I can uh, uh, Tim Schaff, who is a good friend of mine, um, he still has his orders ordering to the OCS at Fort Fort. Uh, um, What's the Fort in Oklahoma? It's the artillery school. Fort, Fort Sill. Sill. 
yep. Fort Sill. He was going to go to Fort Sill and become an. A lot of us had an opportunity uh, to do those things, uh, but we did not. We were just a little different. I regret not taking care up of these opportunities. I regret not going to Recondo School. I regret mm-hmm. not going to OCS. Just you, you learn more when you go to school, and uh, you, and uh, especially the Army is all about training. So I regret being a jerk. And, and not going to these things, but uh, they were offered to a lot of us. Well, I mean, that's, uh, the, I mean, considering you didn't, I mean, for, for all the, the missions you ran and, and the work you did, it, it seems like you did quite well, even without that uh, special training and the special schools and all that. But did was, was one zero school in 1968 a, a, a thing, a big thing at that time? I know later no, on wasn't. everybody's. No, it wasn't. Uh, 68 was pretty early, as it turns out. I mean, there's not many pictures of me. You see, in 70 and 71, before we disbanded, lots of pictures. But we we were told this was top secret. You had to sign your life away for 30 years. I mean, there's a there's a picture of me in my lock looking like, you know, 150-pound wimp. Um, we were told you couldn't do this kind of thing. And I, I was the kind of person, if the Army said it's top secret, you can't do it, you can't do it. So there weren't that many pictures. Um, I know that there was a one zero school later. I did not participate in that. Mm-hmm. It's amazing to me the the guys that ended up going and I, I guess some dog hitting the door. Sorry about that. Uh, and some right. ended up leading teams. Some didn't, uh, there till maybe later on, or they tried not to, to, to stay with the team they were on. And then uh, the guys that did go, and then some of the guys that didn't go to one zero school were absolutely, uh, if you want to say, have a scale. I mean, they ended up being some of the best one zero SOG hat. I mean, uh, it, it's yeah. strange how that ends up or ha- how it is, so to speak. <clears throat> um, when you first get to um, Fubai, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, are so are you immediately did you say you're immediately hooked up with the hatchet forces or are you uh, I was. With- for, for some reason they hooked me up with the hatchet force right after I got out of the, the combat orientation course and I spent a, literally a cup of coffee in Fubai I did not go out on any missions on the hatchet force in Fubai I was sent to my lock to Clyde Sincere to help fill out uh, uh, what it turned to be RT uh, recon team Georgia Wow. Uh, so okay. I, I I didn't hook up with another hatchet force until uh, after the Dewey Canyon disaster in February, March of '69. I became Mike Mike Armstrong's uh, uh, NCO or first sergeant. And uh, speaking of not only Spider, rest in peace to him. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's Mr. Claude. Uh, I'm not sure who that gentleman is uh, in the glasses, but we've got George. Is that right? Uh, Melvin, or uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name. Not uh, Morris. Is that Melvin Morris? I'm not sure. Melvin it's Morris. Mel- yes, sir. Yeah, it's Melvin it Morris. Is. He's got the blue. He's got the Medal of Honor around his neck. Yeah, that's yep. Melvin. He got a Medal of Honor belatedly about 20 years ago. There's Spider, my good friend. We went to Vietnam in 2016 with Spider and Lucy. Uh, we went back to uh, and there. Uh, George Sternberg is the first guy that I saw when I went to my first soar and I went in and he said to me, he said, Doug, you ran with Eldon, didn't you? I said, yes. I mean, that was all I needed to do. Clyde Sincere, my first combat commander, great man. Um, he is struggling right now. He and his wife are struggling. And George Sternberg, of course, is known as Troll. And uh, he ran uh, with Mike. What was Mike's last time? I can't think Tucker. of Mike. Tucker, Mike Tucker, two man team. Great guy, still around. He's from Toledo now, from uh, Tennessee. But uh, yeah, Spider I met on 23 August 68 in the dark. And we, he he wants to tell my wife what I did that night. And I said, I don't want you to tell my wife anything. And and, and he he passed away, as you know. Uh, Spider's not with us anymore. But it wasn't, I, I wasn't that much of a big deal on 23 August 68. Spider was very nice to me. We've uh, we've had some men. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Gene Pugh spoke about uh, the the incident yep. in great detail, and we want right. we we, we want to ask you to go into it because um, c- he's pretty much covered t- 
top to bottom with with the help of again you mentioned the name uh bonnie cooper miss bonnie cooper is a absolute saint and uh she does absolutely amazing work ne other than jason hardy i consider her uh the, the best asset uh of, of right. retaining history and gaining history sog has or at the soa has yeah gene few was in the commo shack he was stationed in Nang. i wasn't i didn't land in Nang until 12 hours before the, the bad guys attack. So he's a really good source for what happened. I've talked to Gene a lot and remember a lot and, and so forth. But Gene's a Gene's a great source. Wow. I mean 12 hours and then you're you're walking into that. Jesus, that's that's terrible. Um again, we're not we, we won't dare get into that right now. Uh I have linked guys though a memorial page to the men that lost their lives on August twenty third in the show notes. Thank you. Please go check Yep, absolutely, sir. Please go check that out and uh, pay your respects to those gentlemen. Um, they're, they're, Thank you they, very uh, much. Yep, yeah, yeah, well, a, a group of heroes, absolutely. Um, could we're, we're not all that familiar. Uh, Jason Hardy, again, my whole back bookshelf is full of every Jason Hardy book. Um, he's not come out with the uh, Georgia book yet, and I've heard it from you and from other people, but uh, was Georgia a, a CCN team? Was it a special Mylock team or what? what's its history? Or do you know? Of, of Not much. It was a CCN Mylock team when I joined it. I went out on the one mission, as, as I've already told you. Um, I've seen other pages where people later on than me in 70 and 71 were RT Georgia. Art, I, I was essentially the one one for RT Georgia for about six months as we were rotating in new one zeros that didn't work. We had one staff sergeant who wanted to be the one zero. We went on a training mission. He fired a M79 in front of me and wounded me for the second time, but it was friendly fire. But the biggest wound that day was the butt of my M79 when I hit him in the head after he, he shot the M79 in front of me. He was an idiot. But we had um, uh, other one zeros trying to come into the team and it never worked out. And I, I eventually left uh, RT Georgia when I, when uh, I went with the hatchet force with uh, Mike Armstrong, but there was, there's another history of RT Georgia that I don't know about, not confident to talk about. Hopefully uh, with Jason's uh, right. treasure trove that he has, hopefully uh, we'll be getting a, a history of RT Georgia because I would very much like to, to hear more about it, uh, especially considering you. And I've even heard rumors that maybe Mr. Eldon Bargewell was on there a period of time or maybe strapped with him a few times. I I, I don't know, but I, I would like to know. I um, don't know. I, I strapped with Eldon on RT Michigan twice. And Jason Harding's got that in his book about R.T. Michigan. I don't know that Eldon strapped uh, strapped with a strand dagger with Georgia. I wouldn't be surprised at anything that he did. What, what could you? Uh, I'm, I'm about to get the viewer questions because there's some building up. But I was curious a few things. Um, uh, could could you? Uh, it probably come up by now. But could you speak about what it was like meeting Eldon for the first time? You mentioned uh, a little bit about right. knowing him post Vietnam, but could you meet? what he was could you tell right off the bat he was going to be pretty gung-ho or what was that like getting to get to meet mr bargewell well he was a very nice guy he took a picture of me it's a shitty picture but he would say if i take a picture of you you're going to survive he was very uh, uh superstitious so he took a picture of me it's a really shitty picture i'm in the recon barracks of ccn but he was a very nice man he was very athletic I mean, he could run like a deer. He'd been a, a good a quality high school and college halfback. And uh, but what he really did uh, that was it was he soaked up uh, the, the intelligence for the mission. I mean, he and he listened to what people told him. He soaked up the intelligence. He got the attitude. What do we have to do? What's our job? What's the first mission? What's the first thing we're going to do? What's the fallback if the first thing doesn't work? What's the second fallback? What's the third fallback? He was a big thinker. He thought about, you know, what happens if we get shot up? What happens after we get start getting shot at and the LZ? What are we going to do from then? What's our mission? He was a big, big thinker in a very quiet way. Um, I always maintained as a sergeant, I never had any trouble with any officers. I was always getting along with the officers. Royals, the senior NCOs were trying to get over on me with their pain in the ass. 
but the officers were never a problem. Eldon was born to be a leader and officer. And, and uh, as long as you worked with him and, and understood, and I, I didn't have any trouble following orders. I didn't have trouble, fault, uh, you know, figuring out instructions and helping him work out the mission, helping him work out the plan and so forth. But, uh, you know, when the plan was, goes awry and you get hit, you know what you do. But he was just a, uh, you know, I knew him as a sergeant. I knew him as a major general. He was the same person. He's a really good guy. We worked hard, and he was easy to get along with. But if you screwed up, don't don't hang out with him. Oh, wow! What a what a man! And uh, I think I may have one of the other only photos that you took, and it happens to be with uh, Mister yep. Eldon and Mike again. And Mike again, yeah, yeah. We were uh, somehow hanging out at the bar, or something. The two ugliest guys in the world, myself and Mike Morehouse, and there's Eldon, the handsomest man in the world. And uh, what uh, a good friend uh, for the ages. He, uh, uh, from all accounts, everybody who ever knew him, it, not even in SOG, uh, always praises praises him. I uh, live probably uh, t 20 minutes or so uh, from where he did live. And um, I from hated Eufaula. hearing yes. yep. you follow. You follow, you yes, follow. sir. Excuse me. You follow. Yeah. Is that I, southern I, I, pronunciation? You follow Alabama. I've been there, and uh, his wife is a good friend of my wife and I. She's a, she's a great lady. My college roommate lived uh, right down the next paved road, and uh, called me that morning and said, uh, "The the man you tell me stories about all the time, the ambulance is there at his house." And sadly, that's how I found out, and was just utterly devastated that uh, yeah, that day. I mean, just, mm. It was so wonderful talking to Eldon after he got me into SOAR, after he got me in the SOA. We would talk a couple times a month. It was just a couple of old guys talking, that's all. He was just the nicest guy, a good friend. I terribly miss him. Uh, we're good friends with Mary and his widow. It's just, it's just a tragedy. We were very helpful. Uh, I'm very glad to have been helpful in, in erecting the memorial to you in, in his old hometown in the state of Washington and um, had a wonderful uh, meeting there with all the people in his hometown who created this wonderful statue here of him in a park. And uh, uh, Kathy and I went out with uh, with Marion and baby son and his wife. And, and it was just a wonderful uh, uh, weekend to uh, memorialize our, one of our greatest heroes. Wow. Um, I've, Mr. Uh, Vern Ward uh, sent me when uh, Mr. Jack Singlob and Mr. Eldon were giving out medals. I don't know yeah. Uh, yeah. what store this was, but um, this uh, he was getting his I, I forgot what the bronze star. It may have been for his uh, POW mission uh, near the DMZ. But it could have I been. This, That's Jack Singlob. He was a great guy, too. Uh, he called as he saw it. You didn't talk to Jack without uh, hearing uh, the version of the world, according to him. And he was a big supporter of the SOA. Uh, as you know, the Major General Jack Singlob Award is awarded by the SOA every year to a senior NCO or a junior officer for distinguished service. And uh, that that uh, the black and red ball in Fayetteville is coming up in May. I will not be there. We're having a retired Colonel, Colonel Allen Shoemate. He's going to be there to give the award with Lieutenant General Braga, who is the commanding general of USASOC, United States Army Special Operations Command. But um, uh, both uh, General Bargewell and General Singlob were very familiar with that award. They're very helpful to us. Wow, uh, man. Uh, here in Colonel Shoemate, which is uh, Walt's son, um, yes, Mr. Correct. Walt, uh, that, uh, the, what, what an amazing pedigree that family has as well. Uh, just outstanding. Yep. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm sure uh, someone will ask it, but I'll get some of the viewer questions uh, since I don't want to hold you too long today. Um, Jason is uh, he's heard only great things about Mr. Claude Sincere. Would you mind speaking a little bit more about what he was like and maybe some interactions sure. you had with him or others sure. had with him? Sure. Clyde was a Mustang. He'd been an enlisted man before he went to OCS. I think he was an E7 before he went to OCS. He retired as a major. Mustangs don't generally rise that high, but 
keep in mind that Eldon Bargewell was a Mustang also. He was in uh, uh, he was an E6 before he went to uh, OCS and retired as a, a major general. Clyde Sincere was my first combat commander in Vietnam. He was the commander at Mylock at the FOB in Mylock. Um, and uh, I, I can remember after a, a terrible mission that I wasn't involved in where someone was killed, he said, just keep in mind, we have a mission to accomplish. We have two missions to get the mission done. And it doesn't matter if someone's killed. That's part of the deal. But we're, we're supposed to protect our mates as well. So the ideal mission is to come back, to have accomplished the mission, get the intelligence, and, and come back. But it's inevitable that some of us are going to uh, not make it. Um, it was a delight to get connected back with him in the SOA because he's been the heart of the Special Operations Association for many years. I worked with him on many sores. He and Mary are not doing too well uh, medically right now. I've talked to him probably in the last month, but he's he's uh, he, he's doing very very well. And uh, he, as I said, he's my first combat commander. You're never going to hear anything bad about Clyde sincere for me. Period. Full stop. Absolutely. I, I actually I spoke to him last week, and uh, he's he's doing uh, as well as can be. As you said, they're they're facing right. some health issues, but he's right. uh, he's taken in stride as as he will do. And uh, I actually need to link up with him here uh, as soon as I can. But uh, yeah. he, as I said, he told offline he he told me to tell all of you hello that he's thinking about all of you. Yeah, he, he joined in bad tolls in Germany, and uh, he didn't go to a training group, and he's, he's a great guy. Absolutely. And, guys, uh, if you'd like to read a little bit more on uh, Clyde Sincere, there's a book by Shelby Stanton, Special Forces in Vietnam or in Southeast Asia, and uh, there's a series called Blackjack um, that covers a the Blackjack Mike Force operations was – which Mr. Clyde Sincere earned a Distinguished Service Cross with the Mike Forces before he went over into SOG. So if you'd like to read yes, more about did. Mr. Clyde, you can read about his exploits when he was actually still running and gunning. Um, yeah, he, he had more than one term and a tour in Vietnam, and he did receive the Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest award at the Medal of Honor while he was the Mike Force commander. Thank you for absolutely. that. Absolutely. 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 Um, Jason, uh, we're always interested in the mountain yards, but, uh, do you happen to remember your interpreter or any of the, the yards on, on Georgia and what they were like? I, you know, I don't know who my interpreter was. I can't remember his name. You may know that we're, we're dealing with a guy named Zwan, X-U-A-N, who was an yes, interpreter sir. for Ken Bore on his team. Was it RT Idaho? Was it Idaho? Yes, sir. I'm not sure. Um, uh, but Kumba was the one that I remember, C-U-M-B-A. He's the one who were on a mission on uh, 30 August 68, uh, uh, had a hole in his shoulder that you could see through. And uh, he was a very young man. And uh, he's the one we went to the hospital at Quang Tree, and the Americans wouldn't treat him. And we convinced the American uh, doctors and, and uh, nurses and so forth to treat him. The, the, the Brew were just wonderful people. Uh, they worked with us. Um, the, at my lock, it was a brew camp right next door called my lock. And, um, um, uh, they, they were wonderful people. We had enough English to, to work with us. We had enough brew to work with them, but I, I can't tell you who our interpreter was. I just remember the Kumba name. Would that happen to be Kumba? It could. I mean, uh, yeah, they're going to say you That's Americans, good. you all look to like it. I don't want to say the thing, same things about that. But he was he was a very good soldier. He is uh, listed uh, with Mr. Bob Donahue's group out of Kason. So, and I'm, yeah, he no, would have been. He would have come from Kason with Bob Donahue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was, that he could was be him man. then. Wow. That could be. That's yep. Yep. Um, let's see. This is interesting because I had forgotten until I looked at my notes and guys, I'm sorry. I've got, uh, I'm getting over a little cold with the, the weather changing here and I apologize. But, um, we were interested in, uh, LT El Myra. Is it El yes. Myra or L? It's like, this, e -L it's like the city. E L M I R A. Okay. We had some teams named after state, some cities, LT, RT El Myra. And I, a, E-L-M-I-R-A, 
and I've got a letter from uh, the colonel congratulating me for my duty on LTR Myra, Elmira. So that 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 was the CCS, which is Bammy to it, uh, one of their teams down there. Oh, okay. Wow. So that was a CCS team. Okay. Yeah, I never was. I was never at CCC. It was at CCS at Bammy to it. I was never at Contum. And uh, CCS wow. was the RT Elmira team. Yep. Excellent. Wow. I That'll give me a whole new uh, thing to dive into and start looking into. I was very curious about that. That's interesting with the uh, the city name. Um, yeah. Jason, let's see here. Um, who would you say was the most responsible for getting you up to speed when you first got into SOG? That would be uh, uh, both the cock course, the combat combat orientation course and my one zero Tom Cofield and Stan seating. We ran some training missions out of my lock and uh, I was carrying the radio, the prick 25, but between the combat orientation course and uh, my one zero and one, one, they really, they really uh, got me going. Wow. Okay. And I think I've, I may have, maybe you can clear this up for me. I've had this labeled uh, under, Let's see here. Would that be your one zero right there, Mr. Cofield? I think that's Tom. Yep. He wow. unfortunately, unfortunately, Tom, and I've talked, uh, I brought his, uh, um, his, his, his nephew to, to soar Tom. And uh, he's really the only one I kept up with. And I wrote him letters. And the last letter I wrote to him was in 1976. I sent him an invitation to my law school graduation and I never got a response. I got a letter returned to sender. I still got that. Tom died in an automobile accident in 1976 in the summer. Um, after all the shit he went through in Vietnam, um, he died in an automobile accident. So I, I found his, uh, one of my goals when I joined the SOA was to find everyone I'd served with who'd lost someone. And I, I've, I've connected all with, with those. And I found Tom's nephew, um, whose name is Ian Crawford, brought he and his wife to soar. And then uh, last year when we had the, the dedication to the Elder Bargewell Park in Joaquin, uh, Joaquin uh, Washington, I met his sister, El Ian's father. And uh, uh, Tom is buried in Vancouver, Washington, which is on the, on the, on the Columbia River on the southern end of uh, Washington, between Washington and Portland, uh, Oregon. Between Oregon, but I, I was very proud to bring uh, Tom's uh, nephew to to soar and and talk about him. He's a great guy. That is outstanding. I, that's one thing about soar. I love the the families y'all getting the families in touch, and then there's yeah. Mister Tom and his brew right here. Yeah, that's Tom. We had the little the little brim they cut short on on the hat. Yeah, that's Tom. Yep. Wow. That's a wonderful photo. And that says July of 1968. Wow. What a that's, photo. That, that would be the month I met him. And I, I was at the end of July. I'm not sure whether that's, that's, that's at my lock. That picture's at my lock. And uh, I would have met him sometime. I, I got into country July 10. So three weeks later, I get to Fubai and then to my lock. So it's sometime around that time. Yeah, that's correct. Wow. Mm. Um, I got that, Jason. You you messed up a little bit. Um, who, who uh, if you can remember, who was the oldest man uh actually running recon that that you can remember in your time in Saw? Uh, there was nobody old. I mean, if you were <laughs> E six or E seven, you were an old guy. I was twenty years old when I joined in Mylock. I turned twenty one in October. Uh, Tom Cofield, Stan Seeing were old men. They were like twenty two and twenty three. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Baird, who wrote me up for the Silver Star, he was probably in his late 20s or early 30s. He's one of these guys who went up stripes and went down stripes. He got into trouble and, and so forth. Art Baer, and, and uh, he was probably over 30, but most of the guys were absolutely in their 20s. We were very, very young. The, the TONE for a unit was to have E6s and E7s and young lieutenants run the recon teams, but we'd gotten wiped out so many times. It was very, very young people running these teams. We were all very young. 
If there was any 130 I'm, besides Hart Beer, I'd be surprised. I'm continually amazed uh, at, at, in Jason's book. Uh, occasionally, an old guy will pop up in their 30s, but that wasn't very long. Oh, that's uh, yeah, I'm, that's real old in their 30s. Most we're all yeah. in our 20s, almost all. Yeah, it, it's, Spider it's might amazing. have been 25. You know, so he would have been an old guy, 25, 26. It's a, it's a young man's game, or was a it's young a man's game. It's very much a young man's game, yep. <sighs> um, Jason is curious. Uh, that's usually a, a good story. Uh, can you talk about your introduction into the Secret War, uh, signing of the NDAs uh, with right. the covered maps and, and such on the wall? It was, that, that kind of stuff is overrated. I mean, we knew it was top secret. We knew we weren't supposed to say anything. And, again, for a young man to get a top secret uh, 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 rating was not unusual. They're going to knock on my neighbor's door and say, did you know, Doug, did you do anything stupid? No. It's going to be easy to get a top secret excuse me, classification as a young man. If you're 40 years old, you got some, excuse me, some history. You might have done something stupid, like getting sued or excuse me, getting divorced or something like that. So we all had easy top secret or top secret inscription um, um, classifications in terms of the NDAs and so forth. I learned about that afterwards. I didn't really learn about it that. I, I just knew we were supposed to keep our mouth shut. Mm. And y'all did. that. That's one thing I'm surprised about. Uh, I mean, even some guys I speak to, uh, will talk to me and don't really like for me to say, Hey, I got information from blah, blah, blah on Facebook or wherever. Right. And right. Uh, it, it's, you guys definitely took, took that, uh, that oath seriously and, and did not break it. Um, no. uh, that, that's what was astounding how y'all were able to keep it secret except for the walkers and the, the leak of the, the spy in Saigon. I mean, y'all held up y'all's yeah. end. Yeah, no, the special forces are the quiet professionals. We keep our mouth shut, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Jason, got a lot of good questions. Um, from Tilt's book, Across the Fence, they mention a saying, Fubai is all right. Can you describe your short time at FOB1 and how it compared to the other CNCs? Well, the FOB designations are always interesting. I've got my uh, plaque here when I oh, wow. uh, left um, – uh, CCN and CCN has FOB one. That was CCN according to the guys there. So the FOB numbers are a little bit confusing. Um, FOB was a was a uh, uh, was a major forward operating base, but it was on the coast. Uh, Denang was on the coast also. Uh, Mylock was better. CC, uh, Bami two it was better because the interior it's better to run missions closer to the Laos border, the Cambodian border than it is to be on the coast. So uh, when, uh, for instance, when 23 August hit and in the middle of the night we're getting attacked, Colonel Barr was at Fubai. He was the commander at Fubai. He uh, uh, organized some helicopters and people to come down and rescue us in the middle of the night. That would have taken some time. But Fubai, uh, uh, we, we just lost John Peters today. Uh, just uh, Tilt Myers uh, uh, sent me a note. John Peters and, and I... Uh, Met, we were in the same hooch on 23 August 68, and he was one of the, the writers with Tilt Myers of the original books. And um, um, uh, he he ran the lounge at Fubai after running a couple of missions with, with RT Rhode Island before they shut it down. So I remember the I remember the lounge at Fubai having a couple of drinks there after uh, uh, I, I ran a mission with I forget what team it was. We went to the DMZ and uh, we we were looking for uh, you had the, the the McNamara line. They were trying to design the DMZ and the Laos with similar foliage so they could hide listening devices and cameras. And so we were being de we got shot out right away. We didn't even spend the night. But I I'd, I'd found a whole bunch of leeches and from my waist down I was blood red on my pants. And Sergeant Major McIntosh met us at the helicopters. They he didn't get in until after nightfall. And he thought I was wounded because I was all bleeding. I said, no, Sergeant Major, it's just leeches, okay? And I just remember trying taking my pants off and probably throwing them away and trying to take the leech off and going to the lounge and having a couple of drinks. Fubai seemed to be an agreeable place. I was happy there. 
Man, that, that wit never fails. Those any time leeches come come up, just gosh almighty, that's terrible. Um, yeah, they were blood suckers. You you mentioned uh, the DMZ. Did you um? And of course, again in Tilt's book, uh, he mentions the Mugia Pass. Were you slated right. for a Mugia? Uh, operation as well? Yeah, I mean, Jim, Pat, that's, that's an interesting story. I'm I'm in Da Nang. I'm now a sergeant. I'm running the RT-0 team as a 1-1 one -one or something like that. And I get a new lieutenant who's to be the 1-0. And uh, uh, he was an idiot. And and we went out on a training mission, and, and uh, my, my bro did not like him. I was taken down to Saigon and, and uh, briefed by a two-star major general in the Air Force. Now, you have to keep in mind, I'm an E-5. I'm a, no, I'm a nobody. I'm a shitbird. But what they wanted to do is insert us in the northwest corner of the Mujia Pass, which is the pass. Well, the, the road from uh, uh, Vietnam goes from northeast to southwest, and there's four quadrants in there. And the pictures were pretty good. They had pictures that you could see 55-gallon drums. And so I asked the, the the general, you know, sir, what's up there? Well, in the northeast quadrant, there's a battalion. The southeast quadrant, southwest quadrant, et cetera, et cetera. I said, what's in the northwest? Where do you want to send us? Well, we don't know, sir. Oh, he didn't call me, sir. We don't know. why. Are, that's why we're sending you there. I said, have you sent any teams there? And he said, yeah, we sent a team in there, an old and dig team, no English, and they had radios. You could put tank. You could put infantry. And so you could push these buttons. And the team didn't come out. They inserted him, didn't come out. I said, that tells you what's up there. It's my old friends, the 5th Panzer NVA. Uh, uh, you know, those are bad guys up there. So uh, my first lieutenant was gung-ho. He was a cherry. had never been in combat. And uh, we went back to Da Nang. We did a training mission. And unfortunately for him, during the training mission, he accidentally fell out of the helicopter and broke his leg. So we didn't go on the mission. And uh, he just accidentally fell out. Uh, but my brew, we're not going to go out with that guy. Wasn't going to happen. Hey, uh, you know, uh, fate intervened. Yep, yeah, it just you know it just happened. He fell out, and he he, he didn't. He just broke a leg. That's all. So we didn't go out. Strange. And, I, I did not go to the Mujia Pass. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Thank As God we just is right. <laughs> oh. Jesus. Uh, we're not going to hold you much longer. We've got a few more here. Um, Go ahead. Let's see. Um, both of these are, oh, well, three of these are interesting. Um, Jason's curious. Uh, actually, for both, well, you didn't go out on the Hatchet Force, so that doesn't count. How much ammo were you no, taking? No, I went out on the Hatchet on? Force twice, but go ahead. What? How much? Okay. We, we how would much take ammo? that for our, for our car 15s, we would have 300 rounds. Uh, for the car 15s and that's in addition to the grenades the smoke grenades the m79 grenade launcher and the personal 45 but generally we had at least 300 rounds and most of them had tracer slugs in them wow was that the same loadout for hatchet force as well uh yeah i i, I you know after you got shot at once you wanted as much ammo as you could so it was okay carrying a lot of stuff because what the people who knew what they're doing exercise fire control. You didn't put the the, the car fifteen automatic. You you, you pulled the, the the trigger one one round at a time. If you if you put it on that automatic, they all go out. You're just wasting ammunition. So you were very careful. You wanted to have a lot. You didn't want to waste it. Man, yeah, and uh, especially when you're out in Indian Indian country that far out, and you've only got three hundred. And if y'all get as y'all did. Uh, come up against a, a pretty strong enemy force. You you got to have all you've got can get in there. Oof. Yeah, I remember uh, for, for some reason on election day, 1968, we had a combo call with a helicopter and uh, our, our interpreter, we had found some uh, wires and we had a wiretap and our interpreter said, there's two battalions looking for you. And I said, only two, that's it. And uh, you know, the problem is that, you know, you we, we knew that if we we wanted to avoid getting shot at any team that got avoid getting shot at was a hero. But if we did get shot at, it was going to be more guys than us. So you wanted to be able to, to give a big blast when you had the first uh, uh, contact with them with all the ammo and all the grenades. So that they thought they were the bigger force and then get the fuck out of there. 
Boy, that is pucker factor to the max right there. Mm. Just, um, just the way it was, that's all. Yeah. Kyle is curious to know if there is a general consensus on which field command is considered the toughest or most dangerous. Well, in, in Mac V Sog, I'm a CCN guy, so we said the CCN was the most hazardous area, but I, I'm not I'm not gonna out and said, you know, anything like that. They're all dangerous. Any, anytime you're doing special operations, it's dangerous. But CCN had more contacts with the bad guys than anyone else. But the CCS guys and the CC, uh, uh, CCC guys were great soldiers and great, great commanders there, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like to compare it to a NASCAR team. You know, you've got into or the uh, organ, NASCAR organization. You've got individual teams racing each other to, to win, but they're all doing it for the better good of that organization. Correct. I'm not going to I'm not going to trash one side <laughs> or the other. It's all tough stuff. Absolutely. Um, Jason, uh, what were the names of the clubs you frequented during your time in SOG? Uh, and who ran yeah. them, if you can remember. Yeah, the, 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 uh, we had every uh, – the one thing Special Forces always had was booze, okay? We would trade uh, stakes with the Navy and get booze. But there was a Fubai club. There was a CCN club. The most interesting club was uh, uh, the, the private houses we had. We had House 10 in Da Nang. We had House 22 in, in Saigon. And someone just put, posted a, a House 22 in Saigon. Uh, we were we were a little bit out of control, and and um, in in Saigon, uh, my wife's favorite story is I'm I'm a terrible card player, and I'm in a bar with some mama son in Saigon playing gin rummy, and I realize she's cheating, and um, I tore I, I turned every table over and broke every bottle of booze in her joint, while my friends are laughing their ass at me, and she's screaming at me. Uh, that was a house twenty two visit, and then. Um, I had another one. Now, keep in mind that I'm I, I'm 20 or 21. I look like I'm 12. They put me in a major's uniform, and we went to the uh, officers' club at Tonsonook, the airport. I think they were just fucking with me. And then uh, we always carried classified courier orders with us. We'd just give those to the MP and say, we're carrying classified orders to get us out of jail. And I got picked up, I think it was with Mike Morehouse in Saigon for a curfew violation that we went into a military police station. They had a drunk GI corner and they were working them over. So we went over and worked over the MPs and grabbed the GI and went home. But we, we had, uh, we were, we were pretty much out of control. We, we, uh, I remember one time coming back from house 22, we stole uh, a Vietnamese Jeep, one of the white mice Jeeps and put it on a C-130. There's house 22. There's a uh, Larry Trimble in front of it a couple of weeks ago. And we painted it in the air so that came when we landed at Tadang, we had our uh, paint for an army unit on this uh, jeep and drove it off. We needed another jeep. So anyway, it was it was we were out of control. Oh, you guys, uh, I, I love absolutely love that. Uh, yeah, you, it, you it, it was are... stupid. We did a lot of stupid things. But then one of my favorite stupid things was a guy who had. And this was alcohol related. He had stole a 175 millimeter cannon, which looks like a tank. It's a treaded vehicle with a big, and and he came into the compound at CCN, and he he crashed through the gates. We had yards of the the MP followed us. The MPs always followed. Us. They hated us, and the guards uh, locked and loaded on the MPs. They uh, they wouldn't let them in. So uh, our guy deserves some punishment. He was court martialed, and uh, the uh, the Army regs at that time, I'm sure they're the same now, required that the defendant have a lawyer. So we had a lawyer for our, he was a sergeant. He later was a sergeant major in Elton Newham. He was a good guy. And uh, you had to have an officer. It didn't have to be a lawyer. So we appointed one of our officers and he blew the case. He said, I can't prove that this guy stole a 175 and crashed through your gates. He was acquitted. The MPs were so pissed they couldn't see straight. But uh, you know, that, was another, that was another story. Yeah. Oh man, I got they, they, they hated us. We need a mini series on you guys. I swear. I mean, we, we've got to get something in Hollywood or at least a streaming service to pick something. Nah, up. It's, um, it was it was just old, just guys. Just um, guys we've got one guys. more. I I can hear your phone. I can tell you're a busy man. And uh, no, no, it's all they, right. My phone's okay. 
Um, Jason, since we were talking about Jeeps just then, he was curious. Uh, you, 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 if you don't want to share yeah. names, but uh, what, 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 did y'all have somebody that was pretty good or maybe the best at acquiring anything or scrounging? Uh, special Forces troopers are, are trained thieves. We know how to steal stuff. <laughs> and I, I, there's not any, anyone who's spent, we would just strike deals. The Navy always has the best chefs and the best food. They eat better than anybody. So though they always had steaks and we'd, we'd, uh, uh, we, we'd give them cases of beer because there's not supposed to be any alcohol on the ship. Um, stealing stuff was just natural to some guys. Now, I can't tell you who is better than others, but um, uh, we, we, we acquired other people's equipment without asking for it. So. That is wonderful. Um, I did have a question because uh, you were sure. about to tell it uh, offline and we, we went online. Um, could you tell us uh, what this young young man's uh, getting awarded for and who's awarding uh, him? Yeah, that's the best picture of me in Vietnam. We had a uh, my first mission, as I told you, after 23 August 68, I did get wounded and uh, Stan got killed. We had an Indige get killed. Kumba got uh, wounded. We had an Arvin. And I didn't feel feel like I was entitled to a Purple Heart. So six months later, today I'm walking down the middle of the street, and our uh, our medic Tommy, who was the chase medic, he said, "You dumb son of a bitch! You might find you as ugly as you are. You might find someone who might marry you. You might have kids." Is that, and, they, that's and they should know you had a Purple Heart. And uh, so he put me in for the Purple Heart. And that's a general there. It's the only general I ever met in Vietnam besides the major general who briefed me on the Mujia Pass. We're at Da Nang. There was a Vietnamese band behind us. Um, and I'm a sergeant now. I was a PFC when I got the Purple Heart. But he's given me the Purple Heart. And that's the best uh, picture of me in Vietnam. That is uh, that that is an outstanding photo of you. Yeah. Uh, are these fellow SOG men being awarded their Purple they Hearts? They are. Well? And, you know... Eldon knew these guys that I didn't. He told me before he died who they were. I don't know who they are. But I'm sure if we put the pictures around enough, we would find out. But it was a, a major general. And he, I don't know what unit he's with. It's got something with a heart. But I thought it was a, the assistant CG from the 82nd. But I could be wrong. But he, well, he was uh, a very, ni very nice man. Nice. Very nice man. They uh, that was going to be my question. Uh, did I mean, did the with the high with the uh general office you, you met, uh, did, did they seem to be okay to you? Because we hear horror stories of when General Abrams would come on the compound later, later on from guys that he was quite mean and you could tell that he actively hated you guys. Well, he, SF, the, the, the army didn't like SF at that time. But no, that general was very nice to me. The major general in the Air Force who briefed me was very nice. As I said, I never had any trouble with any officers. Uh, they were always uh, very kind, very good to me. Whether SF officers, they, they, they were very good to me. I never, I, I had no complaints about any officers I ever dealt with in Vietnam. Um, wow. Zero. Excellent. Excellent. Always love hearing that. Hate when I, when, when guys come across bad officers or have horror stories with with officers they cross paths with. Um, you know, my only wow. issue was Major Moore on Dewey Canyon. He was a jerk, but in terms of um, other people, no, they're, 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 we had very, very good leadership, very good officers, excellent people. Um, to kind of close it out, and I'll, uh, after this question, I'll let you, uh, if you'd like to share anything or, or close out with anything in particular, we can. Um, but in in your whole time in SOG uh, in 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 Vietnam, what what uh, what are you most proud of in in your service? Not necessarily combat or anything. What what are you most proud of? We I served with a bunch of guys who were just terrific. They were just great guys, and we did unusual things, some crazy things, but they're really good guys. They're patriots, and we fought hard for the Vietnamese people, and. Um, um, I'm sorry we're, we're not able to pull it off. Yeah, that y'all did. Y'all fought hard. also for the Cambodian people as well. Uh, yep. yep. South Vietnamese, the Laotians, the, 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 the Cambodians. And to an extent, the, the Thai, uh, y'all are helping keeping yes. the, the communist surge off of all of those people, to be quite frank. Um, yep. 
Uh, is there, uh, before we let you go, is there anything you would like to uh, say or cover before we uh, close out for this afternoon? No, sir. I got nothing else. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on, on behalf of my friends and comrades. I'm always glad to do that. Thank you. We uh, greatly appreciate you spending time sharing with us and uh, going into depth and answering questions. It, it means a lot to us, especially uh, you with your uh, outstanding service to this country and you being the uh, president of SOA. It, it really means a lot for your, you to spend some time with us. So thank you. And uh, there's just an influx of thank yous coming in that I'll pass your way when we get off. Thank but, you, uh, bud. Thank yes, you sir. all. We're going to close it out, guys. So we'll see you all later. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank